Hi, everybody. I am Dangerlander1k here on Twitch.tv, way of the Dangerlander on YouTube. I uh, want to talk about Bat for Blood, and this video follows a line of videos where I basically experienced certain things and wanted to share them because I was playing from early access, and I got my hands on it early, and I'm creating content, and that's what I wanted to do, so I did that, and people seem to enjoy it. I just want to take a moment to say that I was like hovering in like the mid 70s before um, Back for Blood. Uh, I had gotten a boost from playing The Ascent. And then these uh, sort of uh, videos sharing my experiences kind of propelled the channel a little bit. Got some, I like broke through like 100 subs and. Um, People seem to like the content, so uh, I just want to say I'm not in the YouTube Partner Program. I'm not that far up yet. This is new for me, and uh, I just for anybody that that benefited from it and felt like it, it it improved their experience of the game, or made them want to play, or even said, you know what, this game is not for me, or you know, it, like if it helped you guys, I'm really happy that I did that job. And if you like the content, like, I mean, it's really nice. So. Um, thanks for watching, liking, for those of you who subbed, I appreciate it. It's a milestone moment for me to break through a, my first hundred subs on YouTube. And, um, for those of you who've come over to the Twitch channel and dropped a, a, a follow or a sub, man, that's like big support it means a lot. Thank you very much. I just wanted to put that out there, uh, before I go forward. This video is about my takeaway completing the veteran difficulty campaign. So I got uh, through all the checkpoints and I and I finished act four. And uh, and and there are what like I have like eight things to say about that. And then there are another four things. These are not round numbers it's like five things, 10 things, 100 things. No, it's like it's eight. And then it's like another four things because it's the only thing I can think of without trying to squeeze something out of my ass. So it's eight and four. Um, for veteran difficulty, um, if you're working through it, many people are working through it right now. And if you haven't finished it or you're struggling with it or whatever, hopefully these will help. The first thing I'm going to say is um, when you join a game, if you're quick playing for points or just experience or whatever, like I was, uh, you're going to you're going to jump in and you're going to see a bot doing things okay so this is what we learned about bots they're actually way more competent than i think we initially give them credit for bots can stand in acid pools bots have apparently infinite ammunition bots have a, like a timer and a rotation of like four or five different health items if not infinite that they just regularly use i don't know where they get them from, I don't know how it's generated, but it seems like they don't run out. There are occasions where it seems like they do run out, but I think it's like if someone leaves the game and then they didn't have it in their inventory or something. If a bot starts off with you, they've got lives, they've got bandages, they've got ammunition. They share it. Bots don't miss. Uh, they will res you and they will you can direct them sometimes at specific targets like if their back is to a target they'll all turn and shoot once you mark it and they will you can also tag a medicine cabinet and it'll send them there to get healed you know as long as they're not distracted uh downside is you know bots get stuck on the environments i think i talked a little bit about this in the previous video the point that i want to make in this one is not necessarily about how bots operate if you played with bots a little bit you'll see that your runs will be very calm because they're close to you right and um and oh and they do not trigger hordes Those bots do not have uh like when you enter a bot's body the bot doesn't have your deck and the bot doesn't have a gun that is that you've like leveled up or like you've replaced with something better a bot has a a common weapon and when you jump in there's no deck active and there's a common weapon and then there's you so the bot went from having all those bonuses and you've got none of them and you don't have your deck and you don't have an appropriate weapon. 
So if it's not absolutely critical or if the game doesn't force you, my suggestion would be if you, if you jump into somebody's quick play and they were running with bots, let them finish that round. You will still get supply points, let them finish. If you are on voice chat and you're saying, hey, what's up or whatever the case is, you can actually spin the camera around and you can use that to like warn the player where things are at. Don't jump in, that's my suggestion. I'm not gonna say it's the best thing to do. I'm gonna say it's my suggestion. Don't jump in. That bots had all these bonuses and and they're pretty effective at, and, and the, the players already like has a rhythm with them and they might be trying to unlock a checkpoint. I had a situation happen. I don't know if I got a chance to record it where I was in this, uh, I think it was like Cabins by the Lake, maybe that mission and I went up against like two ogres by myself with bots. Took the time, ran, found a place, defended it. You know, these like cabins, killed each ogre, took forever. I'm in the final ascent to leave that mission and somebody jumped in and then just ran off, triggered everything and like wasted my time. And I get you for it. I don't blame that person. That was a, that was a learning experience. And that's part of the joy of this game. You get to look at somebody, do something absolutely stupid, waste their time, waste your time. You get to feel and express a lot of vitriol. And you know, if you're, if you have any frustrations in life, that's a wonderful target for that. You motherfucker, by the fuck, you know, you get to do all of that. It's really great and cathartic. Okay. And then it's out of your system. Then you can relax the rest of the day. So you may not have gotten your supply points, but you got an emotional punching bag. You know, you send all your negative fucking energy at that person for being a dick. But maybe they didn't know, right? Maybe they didn't know what to do. So that's fine. So I'm saying if it's not crucial that you jump in, like like the bot has the opportunity to res the guy. He's right there. There's nothing around you and the bot is just not doing it. You know, like some obvious. Let the, let the player finish with the bots. If they got a routine going, just let them finish it wait you'll get the supply points and then you can start the next mission with them with your deck and you can you know buy a weapon from the store or pick one up you know as soon as you start the mission and then you can get started okay so 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 tip number one let's let bots do the work more times than not okay uh two about bots i was just describing how they operate Whenever you play with bots, many people have, you'll sometimes see them streaming it or they find themselves without anybody in their party and they have, they're just with bots, right? Uh, the bots, they, they huddle around you and then when you alert one horde and, or, I mean, one, uh, one ridden and the rest of the wandering ridden, like, pay attention to what's going on and they start to move into you, the bots automatically seeing that you've aggroed a group will firing squad they'll just shoot through each other no one's dam damaging anyone you know even in friendly fire and veteran they don't do it and they will just mow down any stragglers without without causing any alarms and because they do it like that and they're very efficient at cleaning things out of distance they don't miss when a uh when a mutation shows up they're on the money they just pop 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 pop, pop. they kill it so so what happens is you start to get a sense that by moving a little bit and then helping them clear out a zone and then moving some more into the next territory and then clearing out that zone and you carefully are looking at the corners, you're avoiding the sleepers, you're avoiding the birds, you know, and the bots are on you and they're not triggering that shit. You start to get a sense that it's almost too easy. But I'm going to call that bot pace. All right. I don't, uh, there might be a cooler name out there or a cooler but that's bot pacing bot pacing is deliberate it's tight knit it's focusing it's uh limiting the amount of problems you're hand you're handling at one time into a serial it's not like multiple problems because you're because people are spread out causing multiple situations it's like you have a party leader and then everybody's following that leader and covering that person and then you're moving even if you're you know now, yeah, you're missing out on some items that other players can find. You're missing out on some communication. You're missing out on, you know, being able to trade some things. Sure, but being able to get to the end, have your continues, explore everywhere you wanted to go safely, that's like a big deal. And furthermore, because it's so successful, people will compare, um, like, playing with bots to playing with players and go, wow, 
this was so much more effective with bots, it's not so much the bots, it's the pacing and it's the, it's all of these rules that the bots are, um, are uh, observing that real players don't, you know, cover each other, heal each other, um, uh, you know, I don't know, like, don't trigger shit. And then, of course, there's some exploits, like bots can stand in poison and, you know, they could shoot snitches and things like that. But that's besides the point. Like, you can melee a snitch or throw a flashbang and you can ca you can catch it on a whereas there's ways that you could problem solve it. The, the point that I'm going to try to make is that bot pacing, when players employ it, it is superior and you almost guarantee the run and you can move a little bit faster. The most important thing is that you pick a leader and then you protect each other from group to group. And every time that I've played with a group that has been more deliberate in how they move together, covering each other, exploring the same areas together, usually kind of making sure that their melee is around them, that they're with that person. Not that that person has to lead, but that they're waiting for that person to catch up and they're not at opposite ends. That usually really increases um, uh, survival. I mean, exponentially. And it, and it, it flies in the face of like run and gun. Note about run and gun, there are speed runners in this game and that's cool. And I would imagine in the future, there might even be speed running teams and that's pretty cool. And there are certainly people who operate a little bit more independently and build their decks so they could be very slippery and independent. And that's cool. But I think you know if it's you and you know how to, and you know through experimentation how to make it work. Uh, if that's, you know, if that's not you, uh, stick with a group. And uh, and if you don't know about any of this shit and you're just coming over from another game where everything is a lot more in your face and you think this is like that, uh, I, I'll repeat what I've said multiple times in the past. That's not this game. So uh, bots kind of train noobs how it should feel when things are working right. And hopefully people will take some of that into their own games and provide some of that support when they quick play into other games. Okay? Act like a bot and then smarter because you're human. But, you know, um, stick together, right? And and take your take a, a deliberate, moderate pace throughout the map. Don't, don't just try to bum rush shit. That's when shit falls apart all the time. The, uh, the third thing I want to talk... So the first thing was... Let bots do the work. Second thing was appreciate bot pacing. The third thing is the horde counter. Uh, so um, it, it's roomed events. And this goes into the value of terrain. Mm, man, it's almost like a dream, right? There's a bathroom and all of the cleaners go into the bathroom and there's no windows. And everything that tries to get into that bathroom past your melee just gets blown up. And then you go a little further down the line and there's a cabin and there's like just two entrances and pretty much all the horde are coming from one side and the melee is at the door and everybody's just defending and shooting through the windows and nothing can get through you guys. And then you compare that to any situation in which you're ambushed out in the open and the run falls apart. And just like melee sometimes to be so so overwhelmingly op they're not by the way they can be disabled there's a lot of things that can happen to them they can be dealing with volatile ridden that blow up every time they hit them they, there are weaknesses to melee but nevertheless when you're operating as a team um and really bringing out each other's potential in the right environment the right kind of room or whatever uh, it makes a difference. So sometimes what will happen is like there's like a river in one of these maps and like there's a cabin right across the river. And for some reason, somebody triggered some birds and we just came from a cabin back there and there's a cabin right there. And for some reason, we'll just like chickens with their heads cut off. We'll just start running around the river trying to shoot everything, every direction shit's coming from. We don't even know. Then there's if we had run to that cabin and posted up, you know, formation, right? It's like, you guys remember the Mighty Ducks, the Flying V? That's a really old reference. Anyway, there's a Flying V in this game. And the Flying V in this game is like the Flying Square. I don't even know how to, the Flying Diamond, I, whatever you want to say it. There's a, there's, a, there's a melee at a doorway or at a narrow passage or at a corner 
right? That is funneling. We talked about funneling in one of the earlier videos, all the war towards them, and then people are behind them, protecting, healing, backing each other up, getting each other out of like uh, uh, stalker holds or hawker webs or whatever, but they're all close together, tight knit, at bot pacing, and it's a win. So when shit goes hairy, somebody makes a fucking mistake, somebody's gotta see the right environment. If there's one around, and there almost always is, it could even be like with a tent, but they have to get around to the opening of the tent, right? That's it, man. There are a whole bunch of areas. There's like a, a barn with a tractor in uh, farther fields, right? That barn has enemies out in the stuff, but you see them coming at a distance, so you can pick them off as they come. But there's an entrance to the right where enemies are going to come around. So as soon as they come around, they're going to run into your melee, and then you're going to protect that guy. You know, like it's you have to you have to translate it into the appropriate uh form depending on what you have available to you but that's it man you know you 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 place your melee at a wall and then you get behind them and that is so often what will save you from hordes upon hordes this uh, this is for veteran difficulty by the way this is all veteran tips right now all right so that's that's um that's called the the room defense horde counter Diamond formation. I'm, that's, that's not. That's not the flying V. We'll call it the flying V, or even though I don't know if that makes sense. But when you experience it and you know that it's working, just remember that shit. And when all shit goes to hell, and if you're not the tank, you're not you're not the melee specialist in the group, and you're you know what I'm saying. Look around and see if the other people are with the program. Sometimes they're already in the room, and you're the one outside, and you'll be like, no, and then you see all all huddled up somewhere. When you hear the scream that the horde is coming, check the environment, see if they know where they're headed, and then follow them. I guarantee you, the more people that do this, the more people that succeed at this, the more people will learn by osmosis, whether you're in voice chat or not. Fourth tip um, is uh, the idea of like setting your deck up for a quick play build. You're, you, if you're running with randoms and you really like a specialist hardcore build like a melee or a, a support or whatever, you can run into some problems because coordination isn't something that you can just assume right off the back. So for example, right? Um, I was running a pure melee build for a while and then I found that there were situations like in the Rogers Mansion defense where I the horde are given a modification like flaming or volatile and it's a problem for me I, I i'm at the door but i'm getting blown up it's taking too much trauma damage so i can't do what i normally do even with my temporary health and my defense it's just i don't you know like i would have had to have added the explosive damage resistance to that you know to help that out it it, it starts to chip away even though i'm normally strong against hordes and tall boys and all that shit. and if they add that on top of something else like um like stalkers or whatever and i'm alone on that floor while everybody's getting the cases like it's a problem so i thought about that and i said you know i need to be able to back up and still do my job so i added um i added buckshot bruiser i have all these temporary health mods but if i have to switch to my shotgun i want to make sure that i'm still stacking and taking advantage of that because i get extra defense with temporary health so that's what i did right that's just one example the thing that you want to think about when you're making a build, if it's on the spectrum of like uh, like jack of all trades to like very hardcore, is as you as you go into a very pure build, what is what weakness does that set up for you? When I'm running medic, I was like heal, 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 heal. I want to be able to heal, and it was great until I ran out of bandages because everybody else was going crazy. Maybe they felt a little bit too secure. They didn't realize I had limited bandages to work, even even though I was trying to spawn more in the map right with the support accessory uh, uh card that i had um but so i as a medic needed to defend myself i need to add like trauma resistance i need to add some sort of uh movement card i needed to make sure i needed to add some accuracy i needed to add some defense so i got hunkered down so that i could uh um, you know, I could crouch and absorb a little bit more damage while making sure I get those those precision shots. I needed to think about if my character is up against a wall and it's just me, let's say one person's down or two people are down, 
And we have to start thinking more like independent gunmen for a while. We have to kite, we have to shoot, we have to run, we have to do this. I can't just heal. I have to like help. I have to help myself. I have to survive long enough to then help other people, right? In a in a quick play build, right? You want to step take a step back from stacking all the pure shit. You know, in my um, in my long shot build, which is my attempt at making like a build that's good for, you know, sniping and range support and whatnot. I had to get um, which is it? Face your fears, temporary health. I feel like it's the only card that helps me get some kind of health back, some kind of overshield. Because I know, as Jim, that even though I'm supposed to be in the back sniping shit, there's going to be moments where a Ridden is going to get around and is going to do a little bit of chip damage. And and so that that doesn't eat away at my overall health pool, it'd be great that as things you know escape and get past, and I might be thinking, you know, down the scope or whatever, I need to be able to switch to my sidearm or just melee them and shoot them. And if they're close, I, at least I get some temporary health. I need something. I also added, you know, some armor and I added some, um, uh, did I add, uh, oh, like one of them is like pep in my steps. So like precision kills give me some speed. So within the scope of what I'm trying to do, there are usually defensive secondary attributes or causal attributes, you know, like this thing triggers that, that will help me with like reload speed or uh, movement speed or, you know, anything like that. The, the, the point that I'm trying to get is is that if you're not operating with a team, a well-organized team of friends, and you, you make certain agreements or friends that you make over time, you're quick playing, right? Don't put too much pressure on the melee or the ranged or the support to do everything of that job for you. You need something for yourself. You know, you, you need some kind of way to improve healing for yourself, movement for yourself, improve your own defense you just need it because sometimes you're going to be the linchpin that is expected to bring the team back and if you don't have those basic things in place you'll get chewed up because you have you don't have no offense or you have no defense or you know some 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 shit like that okay so um when i'm not going to tell you exactly what cards to play or anything like that because there are a lot of cards and you can make some really interesting builds i will just say um uh, be careful with builds that are too pure. Okay. Uh, step number, uh, or rather tip number, or not tip, I don't even know, observation number five, right? Uh, I just, um, by finally working and dying and failing and trying again and whatnot, I was able to pretty much complete my card stock. I, the only cards that are remaining that I don't have are like three or four and uh i've been told that they are achievement related i don't even think i do i see them here like they're still locked off but now all of my supply lines are are um damn i don't even see them oh yeah here's one yeah so there's like three or four of them that are still locked off but if you look at my supply lines now i'm not being rewarded cards anymore it's just cosmetics so um there's like an upper limit of cards that you can unlock just from the supply lines and then there's some that are are related to achievements and i don't know if they're game breaking like I you need the achievements you got to get that card because it changes your build i'm not sure if they're that strong uh again a lot of it's based on experimentation just a heads up that by the time that you have earned your way through all the checkpoints in veteran you probably will have accumulated enough points to come very close to if not completing your available card stock from the supply lines which means you have pretty much all the options in front of you for nightmare difficulty across any character any kind of deck you want to build you know there might be some really nice cards missing from those achievements but i wouldn't i wouldn't say that they make or break your readiness you should have learned all the lessons and you should be ready to go we'll get back to that point there's something else i want to add to that but um I will say that uh, with that being said, I still haven't really found that there's a specific meta. People make people feel comfortable with different cards and make interesting use of different cards and talk about different cards in a certain way that they really like. And I don't take that away from anybody. Like, um, you know, there was a card that showed up that was something like you get 40% movement speed or stamina regen or something like that. Um, and 
you... Let me see, it has Carly on it. And it's just, it seems ridiculous to me. Oh yeah, this one, Reckless Mobility. So if you take any damage, even though you have all that sprint efficiency, if you take any damage, you lose all your stamina in that moment. That means you, you can't melee effectively. You certainly can't sprint again. Um, you can shoot, but you have to regain all that efficiency, all that, all that stamina back before you can move around again. At, at the right pace so if the whole thing is you're running from something and it catches up to you and you have no stamina run again you're like dead right but then uh somebody I was playing with today said that in their melee build and it's only when you're sprinting because the melee interrupts the sprint so i'm running to a target and then i use my melee i'm no longer sprinting anymore and they say they don't even feel it so it's very interesting to me um that I was thinking, man, I'm using 40% to, you know, sprint efficiency to get away. They're using it to get into the target and they don't mind not having stamina after that because the sprint's going to be interrupted by any action they take. So I said, okay, so if you're careful, you can just be more efficient and sprint everywhere and, you know, that'd be good. Okay, so I digress. I'm going deep. The point I want to make is that you might feel very strongly about certain cards, about how they work, but other people are using them in ways that you didn't realize. So when people start talking about the cards that they like, just listen, because you're going to learn a lot of stuff. And uh, as far as I can tell, that means that there are no metas, there's still a lot of experimentation going on, and uh, we all can benefit from what other people are doing that seems to be working for them, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so my, my, my sixth uh, sort of observation, right? Um, is that I really got to understand the value of each role more. Like, I got to see the difference between having someone in a support role on the team versus off over my course with Veteran. I got to see what it felt like when you don't have someone who snipes or who has strong range potential dealing with threats at a distance like like wretches or uh incoming exploders i got to feel what it's like when you don't have carly warning you about sleepers and other shit in the area or when you don't have the extra ammunition from hoffman and everybody's running out of ammunition and scrambling to like share what they have i got to feel what it's like when you don't have melee and you really needed melee for flying v formation you know like or whatever you guys want to call it um so every single character that they have does something that you can rely on. And uh, even Evangelo, slippery ass Evangelo. Evangelo is, if he's, if he's fast and he's able to wiggle out a situation, he can create a wonderful like tank by kiting. Like he can, he can run up front and just in front of you, but before they've come to you, he can like zoom around chop 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 zoom around chop 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 you know like person who's playing with evangelo is being I, I have a build that i'm working on called the mongoose that's his that's my build for him um but everybody has their role and uh and that's what playing through veteran campaign started to really show because it puts a little bit more pressure on everybody to like play a role so that was that and uh hopefully you've gone through that process and you've you've appreciated what different different characters can do um, <clears throat> it's also explained the value of like cards and stats and even items. Um, so like, for example, I learned over time that the stun gun is not just there to get you out of trouble. You can also just press the button and use it offensively without even being grabbed up to stun a tall boy, you know, or stun an exploder. I didn't even think about that. So if you're somebody who has an extra quick slot inventory and you decided to pack stun guns, you know, you could be like Black Widow, you know, you could run around them and then and then they and then they're vulnerable. It's not the same as like using a flashbang, but if you combine flashbangs and stun guns for those particular problems, then stuff is being neutralized in a way that normally you would have to depend on a sniper, right? You see what I'm saying? So just through all of the nonsense of veteran difficulty, like I, I started to understand how items can be used in different ways. And then 
In terms of cards, you know, uh, sometimes I'll have something like 10% movement speed and then I'll say, you know, I can upgrade it. I don't, I'm not worried about reducing accuracy because my character is melee. So I, I go up to 15% and, and um, every time you upgrade a card to its next highest stat, 5%, 10%, 15%, there's usually a different detractor that will cause you to think differently about your build. Or maybe you'll just keep it at the card that it's at and not make that change. But you, you definitely feel it in the game. You know, so, uh, you know, things like weapon swap or reload speed, all these sort of like support statistics, you know, um, they do make a difference in the middle of a fight. They do. And and regardless, by the end of veteran, you will have a number of these cards at their highest stat that does prepare you for nightmare in in some ways. You know what I'm saying? So so the deck is is like very useful. I'm not gonna say downright necessary because some people are gonna pull off some miracle plays, just jumping right into nightmare. But uh, for the for the broad majority of us, right, um, we're gonna learn the value of all these different statistics and numbers, and and we're gonna feel the benefit when we get the 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 next upgrade of that. And and also the next upgrade is gonna mean that we can condense certain cards that we were compounding to amplify that. So if you were using a 10% and a 20%, but then you find the 40%, it's like it's nice as long as you can counter the negative attribute, right? So um, there is some confusion about, this is my eighth observation. There's some confusion about, about what kind of cards you get when you start from the beginning of an act versus the beginning of a checkpoint, right? Some people will say that you don't have your guns, you don't have your cards or whatever. So it's like, it's like yes and no. The game imagines you have progressed successfully through every mission up until that checkpoint. And certain acts will start you off with a certain amount of cards depending on the challenge that they have balanced for it. So the game is always trying to be fair. What you're missing out on is that if in the course from the beginning of the act, you lost a continue, and so you got to play an extra card, that is not counted in when you start later on in the checkpoint. So it's a, it's a toss up. It's like you're starting off later on in the checkpoint. You may have one less card than you would have had, but you have that, that continue that you didn't lose. You see what I'm saying? So you'll get that card back if you fail. The, the cards are going to be the same no matter what as you progress through the checkpoints. You know, if you were supposed to have six cards, you're going to have six cards. If you had seven or eight, it's because on the way there, you lost a continue or something like that, you know? Or you found some cards in the map that you paid for with copper. The game doesn't take that into account. Um, that's why you might have more cards in play. But they might not necessarily be cards from your deck or they're cards dependent on a continue. I hope that makes sense. The other thing is uh, money and the weapons you have. So they do give you a certain amount of money, but I don't know how much they factor in. I don't know if they factor in a baseline amount of like performance in the previous acts. I, they, they give you a big chunk, but I don't know how much they give you. It's usually enough to get the team buffs, but it might require you share with ex excess coins with other people. You know, I'm not sure. Mm, but it seems like there is a surplus of coins that they give you when, you, when you're proceeding with the checkpoint. Um, it doesn't seem to be like debilitating and the last thing about guns um even if you can't afford the guns in the shop very soon around there or very soon after they're going to be weapons of the right rarity for that difficulty so if if you need uncommon rare or epic they're going to be all over the map you know especially if somebody's using that one card that spawns more weapons in the map so you don't always have to worry about getting the the appropriate weapon from that box or in, or the safe room or even starting off with it but you should pick up whatever you can that is of that rarity you know so you could defend yourselves um sometimes like if you're a melee build and you're really dependent on melee or shotgun or sniper and that's not available that can suck but i found that there are a lot of weapons all over the place so um so the benefit of starting a, of a checkpoint is if you have limited time and if you really are focusing on progression through a certain difficulty. You don't always have the time to start from the beginning of the act. 
So the benefit that is the balance against the cost. Your cost is you got to find a new weapon. The benefit is you don't have to go through the, you don't have to spend the time in the previous act. You know what I'm saying? It is a benefit because sometimes your headspace is right now oriented around trying to solve the problem of this next mission that's going to give you access to this next checkpoint. But if you got to go through the previous couple of maps, yeah, you might get there and be more kitted out, but you might have lost to continue. You might have a ton of trauma damage. You, uh, you know, you might just be burnt out. You might not have good chemistry with the person that you uh, quick played with. You know, there's all this other shit that can happen. So sometimes screw all that. You can start fresh. You ha have a bunch of money. You'll have your continue and probably you will find a weapon that is suitable very soon. If not in the room, then soon after leaving the cards. Factor in successful runs up until that from the beginning of the act. So don't worry about the cards. Um, but every and everything else is, you know, you can find and make do. So um, that's been my experience. If you guys have any like a source of information that explains this like on paper and makes it very clear, I'd be happy to see that. But uh, uh, the way that I got through veteran was breaking it up into checkpoint chunks. I worked from the last checkpoint on, and that allowed me to really just zero in on like what this map in front of me is going to be about. Um, and uh, that is, that is it. Those are my eight tips. So my eight tips was like, let the bots work. If you're quick playing, let them do their job. Uh, learn and, and totally absorb bot pacing because it'll 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 help you understand the rate at which the map responds to you and how you can effectively respond to it without spawning too much shit um the horde counter right the flying v you know get up in a room behind somebody and with you know solid melee let them do their thing hack 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 you should stuff and as you're moving through a map hopefully avoiding triggering alarms you will spot that's a good cabin that's a good uh, bathroom that's a good little like tented area that's you know that's a nice corner by that truck you know they're gonna that's a little alley they're gonna have to funnel in there you know that you know that if your whole team is there not much is gonna touch you okay as long as as long as your tank is half decent and you've got your 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 range support behind right um um the, val the veteran has allowed me to complete my card stock from supply lines. It has allowed me to learn the value or like to experience the value of different, everyone's different uh, you know, play styles and characters and the different roles uh, from melee to sniping to support to, uh, you know, uh, utility, right? And, and I've also seen the different uses of items and i've come to feel the weight of the increasing stats as i take one card and replace it with the next one up the the ladder in some cases you know so um veteran was a very important step in preparing for a nightmare on a variety of levels because it just gave me a lot more information to work with and um and uh checkpoints are useful Checkpoints are useful. Some people like, I don't know if I want to do checkpoint. I think it's better to start from the beginning of the act because I get extra stuff. Um, the cards are even the and everything else that you need, they kind of supply you with at like a basic level, I think at a fair level. So uh, checkpoints are, are good. I would I would I would try to embrace them as you're initially breaking through uh, your next difficulty run or, you know, uh, because um, because they help they help you just focus on what's in front of you rather than having to rehash stuff later on you may want to do whole acts i would because um you know at that point it, it doesn't matter but it is more variety but that first time through use the checkpoints they help they help you from getting burnt out and that's it for that 